Hey everyone, Mr. Gibson here with your next lesson in cryptography, and today we're going to be looking at cracking the KID RSA cipher. So you remember in our last lesson, we talked a little bit about why we think KID RSA was secure, and then we ended that lesson talking about why it actually isn't. So why was it secure in theory, at least for now? And the short answer is that multiplication is easy to do for us and computers, but factoring is hard. For example, generating the public and private keys only involved multiplication, a little bit of addition and subtraction, and that was really easy for us to do. But trying to determine D, the, the decryption key, uh, when you know E, the public encryption key, and N, the modulus you're working with, that's hard. We did not have a good way to factor those two numbers, meaning finding the product of E and D that resulted in one when we mod by N. And one, because that's the, that's the sign that we actually have multiplicative inverses. Their product is equivalent to one. And that's really the basis for any public key crypto system. It's easy to go one way. It's easy to encrypt messages, multiplication. It's easy to generate keys, multiplication. But it's really hard to take the public key and get the private key um, because the reverse operation is very challenging. So multiplication easy, factoring hard. And we can see that brute forcing is actually pretty good. We can actually crack this uh, as, a, as a technique for a little while uh, until the values of ends get too big. So I've created a table here that shows you some samples, just randomly generated public keys uh, for KID RSA. So that's the first column. I've bolded the value for N because that's the one that really determines how many potential um, brute forcings we're going to have to do to determine the correct value for D. Uh, a typical thing in public key cryptography is to measure the size of your uh, modulus or N uh, based on how many bits you need to represent it in binary. Um, so that first key has a size of 22 bits. Um, and then it took, you know, 0 0.0069977 seconds. So almost no time for my computer to, to brute force the value of D based off of E and M. But as we increase the size of the key, so we increase the value of n to be bigger and bigger and bigger, we see it, the, the length of time it takes to brute force the value of d from e gets longer and longer. And just a 42-bit key now is over 1,000 seconds. So we're talking you know, minutes and minutes to do. Uh, and in practice, n is thousands of bits in size. And you know, 4,096 is becoming the new standard at this point in time for an, a public key encryption is, and so you can kind of scale this out and realize we're talking hundreds of years of time, maybe thousands of years of time, of computation time, to actually brute force a, a public key with this system. So why don't we use it? Well, we mentioned at the end of the last lesson that there's an algorithm that's far more efficient than just trying all the possible values of D, multiplying it against E and C if you get one. Uh, and that algorithm is called the Euclidean algorithm, and it's actually the extended Euclidean algorithm. Um, and this algorithm can be used to quickly determine the multiplicative inverse of any number in a given modulus, assuming that such a number exists. And we're going to use this table approach to kind of make a compact representation of a system of equations. So we're going to take our n, and we're going to put it in the top row, and then to the right of it, we're going to put our value for e. And then in that first column, we're going to put n and then e again, and then some ones and zeros. And here's what this all means. That first row is basically saying that to, in order to compute the value of n, you're going to need one factor of n and zero factors of e. And that second row is saying to compute the value of e, you'll need zero factors of n and one factor of e, and then sum them up. And here's the plan. We're going to use this representation uh, to, to create new equations by subtracting multiples from the lowest or the last row in this table from the row above it with the goal of trying to reduce the value on the left-hand side all the way down to 1 to eventually obtaining an equation that's in this form. 1 equals x times n, so x factors of n, plus y times e, so y factors of e. So in the table, that would look like 1 on the, in that first column with the numbers x and then y in the same row. Um, if we can do that, then it turns out that that value in the table for y ends up being the multiplicative inverse for e in the modulus of n. This is all kind of hard to wrap our heads around with these um, kind of variables in place. Let's work through an example that uses real numbers. 
So here's an example of the extended Euclidean algorithm. We'll abbreviate that with EEA. Um, and we're going to use the public key 2,249, comma, 29,561. So those are the values for E and N. And let's go ahead and set up our table. So we put the 29,561 in the top row, and then to the right of that, the 2,249. And then going down the first column again, we put 29,561 and 2,249 with the one, the zero, the zero, and the one. And again, that's just shorthand for this system of equations that we have on the right. I'm gonna show all of these systems of equations as we're learning about this algorithm, but it's very common that once you get used to it that you only need the table with the shorthand representation. You're welcome to use either one, but I think once you get the hang of this, you'll really only need the representation on the left. So our first step is we want to take this bottom row equation um, and determine what multiple could I subtract from, of this equation from the row above? And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take the value on the left-hand side of this, 2249, and determine, well, how many times does that divide evenly into 29,561? Meaning if I were to divide that, what's the whole part of, of the quotient, ignoring the decimal? And it turns out that 2249 goes in 13 times with a remainder, but it goes in 13 times. So we're going to multiply every element in this equation, so basically multiply the whole equation by the value of 13 to obtain this new value. I'm going to temporarily put this in the table. It doesn't really go there, as we'll see in a second, but it's going to help for our calculation next. So we've created a new equation that's equivalent to the old equation. We've just scaled it up by a factor of 13. And now we're going to subtract off this new equation from the top row to create yet one more new equation. So we can do 29,561 minus 29,237 to get 324. We could also do 1 minus 0 to get 1. And we can do 0 minus 13 to get negative 13 in our table. And I've written the corresponding equation to the right. And we'll go ahead and put back that original value in the second row. So we used some multiples of the second row, subtracted off from the uh, values in the first row to generate these new values in the third row. And the third row is still a true statement. 324 is equal to 1 times 29,561 plus negative 13 times 2249. That's true. We don't know why that's helpful yet, but we're going to see we're going to get there in just a moment. We're going to do the same thing. We want to think about now focusing on the new bottom row in the table. How many times can I multiply this equation by to generate a new equation where the product on the left is less than 2249? So we can take 2249, divide it by 324, and we see that that goes in six times with the remainder, but that means we're going to scale this up by a factor of six. So I'll show that here now. Again, we'll take our bottom row of the table and subtract it from the previous row. So 2249 minus 1944 gives us 305. 0 minus 6 gives us negative 6, and 1 minus negative 78 gives us 79. And that gives us a new bottom row in the table. And again, you can check that that calculation is true. 305 is in fact equal to negative 6 times 22,561 plus 79 times 2249. Again, this is not helpful for us yet, but we're getting there. Remember, the goal is that we want that left-hand number in the table, whether in the shorthand version or in the elongated equation, we want that value to be 1. It started at 22,561, we've got it down to 305, and we're going to keep working. Okay, how many times does this equation go into the one above it? Well, 305 only goes in one time cleanly, which means that we can just subtract this equation as is to get our next row. 324 minus 305 is 19, 1 minus negative 6 gives us the 7, negative 13 minus 79 gives us the negative 92. And again, there's the long version right up next to it. We're getting close. We want to figure out how many times does 19 go into 305? It goes in 16 times, and when you do that, multiply this up, subtract the bottom row from the second to last row, and here we are. We've got our equation we were looking for. 1, negative 118, 1551. And this is the equation that gives us the private key. That private key is at 1551. So we'll verify that in just a moment, 
But if you were to encrypt a message using the public key of 2249 with a mod of 29561, you now know that the decryption key on the other end is 1551. They are inverses of each other. We've just found somebody's private key with only the public information. That's not what we want if we're going to use this system. Let's verify real quick that these two are inverses of each other. And to do that, we're going to use this long form equation, not the last row in the table, but the corresponding equation for the last row in the table. So let's take a look at it. This is going to be helpful for us. Here's why. If we take the factor that includes the 29,561, so that negative 118 times 29,561, and we add that term to the other side. So now we've got 1 plus 118 times 29,561. We know that's equal to 1551 uh, times 2249. That's the private key times the public key. At least that's what we believe to be true. Let's see why that actually is known to be true. If we take this equation and we reduce it, mod 29,561, that left-hand side is going to just boil down to 1. Now, why is that? Let's take a look at that left-hand side on the previous row. 1 plus some multiple of 29,561 modded by 29,561. The large numbers make it hard to think about, but let's, let's take it down smaller. Let's imagine that was 1 plus 26, and we modded by 26. It shouldn't be a stretch for us to think about, well, 27 mod 26 is back to 1. And if we did 1 plus 2 times, 26, which would be 52. Uh, it's not hard for us to, to compute that, yep, 1 plus 52 mod 26 is back down the 1, and so on. So in that small scale system, 1 plus any multiple of 26, once we mod by 26, goes back to 1. Same thing here is true. 1 plus any multiple of 29,561 modded by 29,561 is going to yield us back the number 1. So now we have this statement. We didn't do the calculation on the right yet, but we can see on the left, it's going to be equivalent to 1. And what is it equivalent to? The product of 1551, the private key, and 2249, the public key, modded by 29561. We have just shown that those two numbers are, in fact, multiplicative inverses in the given mod, and that is the only requirement for a key pairing in this system. So what we've shown is that we have an efficient way now to determine the private key from the public key. And that is made KID RSA insecure. In our next lesson, we're going to look at how can we adapt the KID RSA algorithm to make it secure? We're going to need to do better, I guess, than trying to just rely on that it's hard to calculate multiplicative inverses. So you can take a minute and think about how could you make that more complicated. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.